Test one, two. Welcome. Thank you.
Good morning, both folks joining us online and in person for our special event today. We are joined by folks from our Lakeview Lutheran Parish, so that is very exciting. It's the first time we've done that, and we are hoping to have other events like this, maybe three or four per year at our various congregations and doing a variety of music. So we're very happy today to welcome Thomas Schmidt uh, with us, and I will let him, he will be both talking and playing, and maybe through that you'll learn a little bit about him as well. So let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I uh, am absolutely delighted to uh, share this Beethoven Sonata with you today. Um, <clears throat> I thought I'd uh, tell you a little bit about myself first, and then I'll tell you something about the Beethoven. Um, I uh, spent my career in New York City after growing up in the Midwest, uh, and uh, <clears throat> had a three-part uh, musical career. The first 20 years after uh, graduating from Valparaiso, uh, I taught at Concordia College in Bronxville, New York. Uh, and uh, during those years, I would be accustomed to give piano recitals uh, most years and uh, uh, teach. I was the major keyboard uh, uh, piano teacher there. Um, <clears throat> And then in 1980, uh, after meeting uh, a violinist and cellist who were classmates of mine at Yale, where we were doing graduate work, uh, uh, we formed uh, the Arden Trio and uh, won one of the competitions uh, in New York City and had our debut concert and uh, began 25 years of uh, touring and playing concerts throughout the country and uh, a couple times in Europe as well. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm mainly a chamber music pianist, and uh, that was really my performing career. Uh, I was uh, telling Craig the last solo piano playing I did would, would have been around 1980. So, uh, so this is exciting for me. That, uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, after uh, moving to Chicago uh, upon retiring, uh, Kathy and I uh, have grown to love Chicago uh, equally as much as we loved New York. And uh, uh, I, for the first time in many, many years, uh, could sit down at the piano and just play for my own enjoyment. Uh, there was no concert coming up that I had to prepare for. And so I've, I've found myself drawn to music that uh, either I always wanted to play. Uh, I, I learned the Chopin Preludes, the 24 Preludes, and uh, a couple of years ago, I was, I, I was going to uh, play them here, but uh, uh, then the pandemic happened, I think just a couple months before that was scheduled. Uh, and they aren't in my fingers anymore, so I couldn't play those anymore. So. So when Craig asked me if I'd be interested in playing, uh, I said, well, no, I don't really have anything ready. And then I realized, well, I had been <clears throat> going back to the Beethoven Opus 110 Sonata because it was my favorite Beethoven piece, and uh, I had learned it when I was 17 and hadn't played it since. Um, now that I think of it, my piano teacher in high school was pretty outrageous to assign the Opus 110 to a 17-year-old. Um, <clears throat> but I count that experience, among other pieces of music that she also outrageously gave me, uh, to, uh, uh, to have a very happy adolescence. Because while everybody else was uh, having a hard time making, uh, figuring out who they were and what they were supposed to do. And uh, I was trying to figure out how do you make sense out of this Beethoven sonata. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and I'm so grateful for that. Uh, so anyway, uh, the Beethoven Opus 110 is 
uh, number 31 of the 32 sonatas, piano sonatas, that Beethoven wrote. Uh, so it is one of the late last works. He wrote it in uh, 1822, actually didn't finish it until the beginning of 23. Um, but he dated it 1822, and he uh, lived until uh, 1827, where he died at the age of 57, uh, born in 1770. Uh, so even though it, it is in his late period, we do have to remember he was in his early 50s when he wrote this. We wouldn't call that really late today. Uh, but uh, he had uh, suffered many physical ailments in his lifetime, and he truly was an, uh, uh, a sick old man by the time he wrote this piece. Uh, in fact, the uh, year uh, 1821, uh, he was very seriously ill, and he had begun to work on the sonata, but he had to put it aside for uh, many months uh, before he could take it up again. Um, the, the late period of Beethoven is uh, often called uh, a period of introspection because uh, he went beyond the uh, classicism of uh, his early music. Uh, the, the first sonata that he wrote, number one, sounds like Haydn. And the uh, uh, more dramatic uh, middle period where he wrote uh, sonatas like the Appassionata Sonata. Noel and love uh, for his brashness and uh, his uh, an announcement to the musical world that he could do uh, what uh, Napoleon had done to the political wor world, we could say. Um, <clears throat> uh, so the late period is he's done all that, and now he can look inside himself and see what else is there to say. Um, and uh, that is also combined with the fact that he was, uh, had been growing deaf for many years, and by the time his late period comes, he really was completely deaf. So all the music that he wrote, from the Misa Solemnus to the Ninth Symphony to these late sonatas, uh, we have to keep in mind he never actually heard other than in his head. And one of the interesting things that happens in his piano sonatas, the late sonatas, is that he often has textures which he would not have had earlier on that are characterized by the right hand being very high and the left hand being very low. Um, maybe it's because the sound that he imagined uh, was more filled out than the sound that actually was produced. I don't know. Uh, but uh, he often does that. Even the opening chord of this sonata is spaced a little wide. It's a wonderful sonority, but it's not one that the textbooks would say was really good. Um, the sonata, getting directly now to the Opus 110, uh, is one of three uh, that are uh, grouped together, the Opus 109, 110, and 111, that uh, pianists often perform as a complete recital. 
uh, and that's because they um, are each so individual um, and, uh, and have such a wide range of emotional uh, expression. Uh, the uh, Opus 110 is the only one that ends in triumph. Uh, the Opus 111 only has two movements instead of two or three, or three or four. Uh, and uh, you could almost call them death and resurrection, peaceful resurrection. Um, but the Opus 110 has elements of all those things combined with a uh, calm serenity in the first m movement that uh, is one of my favorite <laughs> movements, let, well, I'll just say that. Um, the, uh, the first movement of three uh, has uh, a theme which is marked uh, with love. He pauses almost before he gets going. And then he goes on to the rest of the first theme. The opening movement of almost every sonata is written in what's called sonata form, and there are usually two themes, the main theme and then the secondary theme, usually quite contrasting. Uh, there's also a closing theme. You can figure that out. Um, <laughs> and then uh, after those have been presented in the first section of that form, uh, the exposition, that's followed by a development section where the themes are uh, fiddled around with and uh, developed. And in this case, uh, he just takes the one motive. And repeats that in various keys. Um, exploring various keys. Uh, and then that's followed very quickly. It's, it's a very brief development section. Uh, the, the main theme returns uh, in the recapitulation. But this time, the theme is accompanied by all those 30-second notes, so it's a little bit different.
Now remember the second theme? Well, when the second theme comes in during this recapitulation, it comes in in the wrong key because there are some rules about how you're supposed to write this sonata form. And one is that the, uh, in the first part, the exposition, the two themes are in different keys, the tonic and the dominant. But when they return at the end, they're both reconciled to the same key. Uh, and uh, he uh, does a modulation after the first theme in the recapitulation and gets to a rather distant key of E major. Uh, and uh, the second theme appears in this key, and then all of a sudden it's as though he realizes, wait, I'm in the wrong key. <laughs> and so he does a, an abrupt change, and it sounds like this. It's a little bit of Beethoven humor. So uh, that's the first movement. The, the second movement uh, is a scherzo, and it's very straightforward uh, and uh, uh, rather jolly, although it's in F minor. Uh, and it sounds uh, like this. So that's uh, the second movement. Uh, the, then the opening part returns in the second movement. Um, now the third movement, uh, which we would call the main act uh, of this uh, sonata, uh, is the most unusual part and uh, the most moving part. Uh, it consists of five parts, uh, an opening recitative, followed by an aria, followed by a fugue, followed by another aria, really a, a different version of the first aria, <clears throat> followed by a second fugue, and that leads to the ending. Fugue, aria, this is, you know, the music of Bach. Uh, and uh, that's one of the ways in which Beethoven uh, in his uh, late period, looks back and uh, at the whole history of music and claims it for his present day. Um, <clears throat> but he also adds to that uh, the most personal uh, kind of expression. Uh, the opening recitative uh, could be, could almost have been written by Bach. Uh, some, someone said it reminds them of one of the recits in uh, the St. John Passion. Um,
that's as good as he could think of on how to do that. So the, uh, the recitative quickly comes to an end, and that leads immediately, uh, without pause, uh, to the aria. And uh, Beethoven calls this a klagender gesang, which is a song of lamentation. Uh, various commentators have, have said, well, what was he lamenting? Perhaps his illnesses, perhaps the fact he couldn't hear, um, perhaps all the things in his life that had not gone smoothly. We don't know. Or maybe it was about someone else, maybe just a general song of lamentation on the human condition. Um, but it sounds like this. looking up and uh, signaling there is hope amidst this despair. Uh, however, it's incomplete because at the end of this fugue, by the way, the fugue is written skillfully. It's worthy of Bach's part writing uh, because very often during the Romantic era, uh, fugues started out okay and then they sort of degenerated into melody and accompaniment. Uh, but he keeps the part writing pure and interesting in all three parts of the fugue. Um, but at the end of this, as I say, it doesn't finish. It, you might say the bottom drops out and we return to the despair of the aria. Sounds like this. It's the same theme, it's the same aria, but this time uh, he writes dolente, so sorrowing, but ermatet, which means exhausted. It's as though the sorrow has become too much and he can't get enough breath out to finish the line. And so the melody is broken up by rests constantly. It's as though he's sobbing uh, in between the melody.
extraordinary writing, I think. Uh, if, you, if you're not aware of, of what he's trying to do, it can just simply sound weird. Uh, and it does sound strange. Um, but uh, uh, I think that in this second broken work of art, uh, Beethoven has revealed the, the, the complete depths of, of the human soul. Um, this comes to a conclusion, and this time, uh, well, listen to what happens. So at the very end of this aria, which is in G minor, all of a sudden it becomes major, G major. Uh, and that leads to a return of the fugue, but this time the, the subject of the fugue is turned upside down. Uh, and instead of being four, uh, three rising fourths, it's three descending fourths. completely what Bach would have done. Um, and uh, uh, he uh, sets forth the three voices, which I just played for you. Uh, and then the original form of the fugue uh, starts to return, but uh, twice as fast. Um, and three times as slow. Um, and he puts those together at the same time. Uh, so again, worthy of, of what Bach did all the time. Uh, and then that begins a return to um, the hope and the faith uh, that uh, the, the original form of the fugue expressed. And uh, leads to the, a triumphant uh, ending. So uh, that's enough said, I think, about uh, Beethoven's Opus 110. Uh, now I think I'll, I'll perform it for you. Um, I th you know, I think I will use the score. Uh, could you turn? Yeah, okay. So...
Thank you, Tom. He will, I'm sure, share other observations or reflections upstairs if you want, but we are going to move to our Passivant Hall for lunch, and we hope that all of you can join us. There um, is an exit on each side and a stairwell, 